Sometimes we look at uh, world events and it looks like the world is in such a mess. And we wonder what we can do about that. Certainly, as Christians, we have the book that is our foundation, and that book being the Bible, sitting on the table here, which we refer to often, uh, gives us the answers to our problems and helps us in many ways. Uh, Peter, what do you think about world situation right now? There seems to be, the world seems like it could be on the brink of war. Let's not forget, there are places that aren't only on the brink of war, but they are suffering from war, as, as we've talked about. There are a lot of little conflicts here and there. You know, thankfully, we are in kind of a peaceful part of world history. We can, uh, you know, t take advantage of the time to spread the gospel, do good works, and always kind of be on the lookout because, as, as you said, there are some ominous signs. I think, I think what we were going to talk about here was the possible Ukraine-Russia conflict. We look at an organization like NATO, which is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which by its definition sounds like a pretty nice organization which might bring peace to a conflict which was created right at the end of World War II. And then uh, yesterday or a few days ago, the United States sent 3,000 more troops to join NATO forces in Poland and Germany. And of course, along with those soldiers came a lot of armaments specifically to help the Ukrainian forces in case war broke out because of the 100,000 or more soldiers, Russian soldiers on the eastern border of Ukraine in Russia. Right. And, and at the same time, it's interesting because the Olympics have started and Putin just had a meeting with President Xi of China. Should we be nervous that there's going to be a war and could this be World War III? Well, interesting how you mentioned how these, these NATO forces are going there in response to something happening in Ukraine, which is not a member of NATO. You know, it's supposed to be a, a, a defensive treaty to um, uh, protect each other from Soviet aggression. Now, that has evolved a bit since the end of the Soviet Union, um, and it, it has been moving eastward. And the fact that they are building up for a possible conflict over Ukraine is a little bit concerning because that's not what NATO was was meant to do. And also the, the, the fact that um, if you listen to the presidents of Ukraine and of Russia, they aren't talking about going to war with each other. They want things to calm down a bit, especially poor Ukrainians. You know, they're for the, it's bad enough to be uh, facing off against Russia. And yes, there is some tension between them. Imagine then if, if uh, the whole Western media is talking about with, almost with expectation of your country going to war with Russia. It's a pretty tough thing for people in Ukraine right now. Uh, it's interesting in light of the fact that the USSR collapsed in 1991. It was that same year that the president of the United States, then President George Bush Sr., declared that the United States was going to lead a new world order. It seems with Putin meeting President Xi right before the Olympics, the Winter Olympics started, that maybe they had another new world order in mind other than this one that former President Bush proclaimed so in a, 1990. A new, new world order? A new, new world order. Now, when you use a term like that, a new world order, you wonder, does it, is it related to Bible prophecy? Is somebody trying to take over the world and have an order with, where somebody sits at the top and could that person be the Antichrist or mm -hmm. an Antichrist? And that's, that's what people in Christian circles start talking about. This right. must be it. We're getting into the end right. time. And it's funny the way so many civilizations end up, <laughs> they end up with uh, someone wanting to get worshipped. You know, whether it's Nebuchadnezzar and his golden image or... Uh, some of these Roman emperors, you know, the, the, these um, people's minds, uh, as, as the Bible says, uh, the wisdom of man is foolishness to God. And it, we kind of often end up going that direction. Now, uh, of course, we don't know exactly where we're heading right now, but it is something to look out for because we do know that there will be a figure who's going to uh, unite the whole world around worshiping himself someday, you know, the, the Bible tells us that that will happen before the second coming of Christ. So let's keep in mind that, you know, no, no matter how um, advanced we uh, seem to be getting as a culture and a civilization, we, we have these 
pretty dangerous foibles that will uh, do and will come back to bite us if we don't uh, give our lives to Jesus. Uh, it is interesting that uh, Putin spoke for the first time publicly in a while last week, and he said that uh, NATO has gone against their promises that they weren't going to come so close to the border of Russia mm -hmm. and that they've broken their promises, claims he. Uh, the situation in the Ukraine is pretty tense right now. We received a letter from some missionary friends of ours. And uh, Peter, would you like to read that letter? And it's interesting because this is a firsthand reaction from someone who is there, and this just happened a few days ago. Yeah. Okay, this is a uh, letter from missionary friends in Ukraine. So they say, Dear friends, we have been getting lots of messages from so many of you asking if we are safe because of the situation with Russia and Ukraine. After much prayer and seeking the Lord, we have decided to leave Ukraine for the time being. It's with a heavy heart that we do so, as there are so many here that we love and have grown very close to. As we are sure you are aware of, the noise of war is all around us here in Ukraine. And many in the foreign community have opted to leave and even now some Ukrainians are beginning to do so, or at least those who can. This was to be an epic journey as we were planning to travel by car to the border. We had no idea what we would be facing as we attempted the crossing as the border could be packed with others trying to get out. We drove all day Saturday and half of Sunday to the border and when arriving at the border we found out that it was majorly backed up. So we got a hotel in the small border town and went back the next morning and were able to cross, although it took many hours. Your prayers are much appreciated as leaving the beautiful land which we have called home for the past 18 years broke our hearts. Our prayer is that this will all pass without a war starting and without the loss of lives and that we will be able to return to our mission field. On Monday we arrived safely in Croatia where we have friends with whom we have had a standing invitation to visit in case a situation like this ever occurred. We will try to keep you updated as much as we can. Again, please pray that there will not be a war and that we will be able to return to Ukraine as soon as possible. We are so thankful for your prayers, especially for peace. So this is the prayer request that we'd like to put out there for our, all of our viewers, and that is peace in the Ukraine and that there will be no war. It seems like the main players in the scenario now between Russia and the United States, even though NATO is the organization that is supposed to be uh, stopping any war from happening in Europe. And now this big third player, China, literally backing Putin. And so along with the Ukraine situation comes on the table the situation of Taiwan, hmm. something that China has been uh, beating its drum about for, for many years, saying Taiwan should be part of China. Uh, could you brief, give us briefly the history of Taiwan and what happened there? Well, so Taiwan, that is uh, also known as the Republic of China. That's where the Republican government of China fled to when they lost the civil war on the mainland and they set up their government there with plans to continue the war against the communists. Things kind of settled to where, you know, the communist government rules the mainland and this, uh, the nationalist government ruled the, the island of Formosa, which uh, ended up now being called Taiwan. And, and Taiwan has a very powerful ally mm. in the in, United States. That's right, who for a long time would not even recognize uh, the communist government of China. I think that changed in the 70s, is that yes, right? Yes, they made a deal. Uh, they recognized China mm -hmm. and they no longer recognized, I believe, Taiwan uh, as an independent nation, but at some other status. It was kind of a compromise with China that they made so that everything would continue yeah. peaceably. Yeah. peaceably. Um, so here are the main players now, Russia, China, the United States, NATO organization, which could be all of Europe. And in relation to uh, Bible prophecy and the book of Revelation, and especially uh, Revelation chapters 17 and 18, Christians are looking at those chapters, trying to, trying to figure out, are these the pieces of the puzzle that are coming together to fulfill these prophecies? It does seem sort of like a massive chess game. Uh, like Biden said, here's my move, 3,000 troops to NATO, and then 
Putin a few days later, here's my move, I'm going to China, and China makes a, a move and check, checkmate, and mm -hmm. <laughs> it just seems almost like a chess game unfolding in front of our very eyes. Yeah, well, a, a chess game where um, winning isn't very attractive if, if it ends up with a war. I, I think, you know, these players would do better not to play if that is indeed what they are, are doing. Um, we've seen how um, in the past it's fairly easy for these leaders to come together, have a nice moment, and bring the tensions down. And, well, it uh, seemed like that was what, what was happening not too many, not too many years ago when uh, President Xi and his wife met Trump and his wife in Mar-a-Laga, and they came out of a dinner with big smiles, and how fast the, that whole situation deteriorated. Sure. The so trade it, war. Right. It, so it, it can be done. I mean, you know, uh, it would have been easy for the, the Biden administration to send some uh, top dignitaries to the Beijing uh, Olympics. You know, th these things, these aren't these aren't impossible situations. There's, there's no inevitable march towards war. We just need um, people to kind of pursue, seek peace and pursue it, as the Bible says, and, and peace can come quite readily. Some stunning moments at the opening ceremony of the, of the Winter Olympics, uh, there when the Ukrainian team was marching in with their flag, uh, the cameras took a shot of Putin in the stand, sitting by himself, and he looked like he was falling asleep, like he was completely uninterested in the Ukrainian team. Of course, when his team came in, he stood up and lifted his arms and, and you know, waved to them. But uh, it's, he it was almost making a statement like, I'm not even concerned about those people, they're mm. the Ukrainians. I, whatever message he was trying to send with that. And then, of course, the stunning panorama with all the government officials sitting in the stands, minus any U.S. officials. Yeah, that's, that's a little unfortunate. You know, this, this would be a time to um, make a statement that, that, yes, we are seeking friendship and diplomacy with the other major powers of the world. And the United States having one of the biggest teams of athletes at the Olympics marching in and not one single American official sitting there. Right. And, and the reason for that, as well as several European countries also who decided not to send any official representation other than their athletes, give us a bit of background on why the United States decided not to send any officials from the government to sit in the stands representing I, their country. I think this would probably have to do with uh, what's been going on in the uh, western Xinjiang province of China. This is where they have a large ethnic Uyghur population. These are, are Turkic, Central Asian, predominantly Muslim people. And there has been this ongoing accusation with some evidence that uh, China is attempting to suppress or even um, wipe out their cultural identity. And, uh, and these people are predominantly Muslim. Right? Yes, yes, that, that's right. And, and some of the more sensationalist stories have even gone as far as to call it a genocide, what is happening now. That's a pretty strong term, and there hasn't been evidence of that. But, uh, you know, to be sure, China is an authoritarian government that has, I'm sure, been doing some authoritarian things. Tiananmen, Tiananmen Square and some of yeah, what so happened there. Yeah, we, so we, we, know, we know they aren't uh, incapable of, of doing brutal, using brutal measures against right. a population that they consider dangerous. And there has been a danger, and there have actually been attacks by Uyghur extremists and separatists against uh, the Chinese population, both in Xinjiang and in other uh, parts of China. So though, you know, by and large, um, the, the people there are, you know, fairly, you're fairly average Chinese citizens, there, there is kind of a fear, I think, of separatism and extremism. And China, the Chinese central government has used some uh, tough measures uh, against that. So the United States makes a pretty strong statement by not sending any government officials to support the American athletes, along with some European countries who do followed suit with the United States. On the other hand, the Chinese government made a pretty strong statement by having one of their athletes who happens to be from the Uyghur population lighting the torch, the Olympic torch. Wow. Also, the flag raising ceremony, uh, the Chinese flag was very dramatic, and it was very clear in the commentary that the 
Chinese government wanted the world to know that China has 55 or 56 different ethnic groups as part of their country, and all those ethnic groups were lined up as they passed the flag to the soldiers to, to, raise, it at the, uh, to raise the Chinese flag at the Olympics. And as the camera passed all of these different ethnic groups, there you saw them dressed in their, their costumes with big smiles on their faces. And that was China's statement back to the world that we don't suppress our ethnic groups. <laughs> Whether it was subtle or not so subtle, it, it really stood out. Interesting, yeah, and, and as the saying goes, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. So, you know, th though people may have one idea about China, you see that on the TV, and it uh, certainly can shift opinion in a, at least subconsciously, in a, pop, in a more positive direction. No matter what we're faced with in the world today, the fears, fears of COVID, fears of mandates, fears of war, fears of inflation, fears of the future, the one thing that we do have is we have the rock to stand on, and that is the Bible. And we have uh, God's word and God's love and God's promises to take away any fear because the Bible says... The apostle writes that there is no fear in love because perfect love casts out fear. And that's pretty significant. Yeah, like the old song, he's got the whole world in his hands. Mm -hmm. And we certainly trust God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, and that takes the fear away from us. And as long as we have the fellowship of our Christian brothers and sisters, and we are in tune or trying to connect with our Creator, there's no reason that we have to live in the fear that some people uh, seem to succumb to. We'd like to thank you for being with us here today. We'd like to hear your comments on some of the statements that we've made and please leave them below. If you haven't yet subscribed to our channel, we'd like to give you an invitation to do that right now. We look forward to seeing you again soon.